kind of making it happen on the fly. I am lucky enough today to have with me um, not only, I, I'll, can I, I'll call you a new friend because we've yet to have the opportunity to really get to know each other, but not only a, a friend, but also a fellow photographer and a super talented photographer at that. Kanayo Adibia is with me. Thanks, Kanayo, for hanging out with all of us today. Thanks, Nathan, for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, and this is one of those situations where uh, there's a little bit of, uh, I, I guess I sit here in a little bit of awe of Kanayo's work because as a photographer, Kanayo, I was never the artist type. Um, I, I photographed for over 10 years. I shot hundreds of weddings, engagement sessions, and so forth. But I never had the opportunity to, I guess, develop the craft. I never had the passion to develop the craft as an artist. I was more thinking about it as a business. And I, I have to say that your work is more along the lines of, of art, and I'm a little bit envious of that. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, um, a lot of my inspiration for actually becoming a photographer started from wanting to be able to express myself creatively. Um, so it definitely, I definitely take the arts, artistic approach to it, um, you know, and uh, I, by default, ended up being someone who earned an income from photography. So the art has always been the inspiration for the photos. Well, it, it is that. And let me actually share my uh, screen here for everybody listening in. I, I want to actually show you for those of you who are, who are, I say watching, I should say watching those of you who are listening, you're going to want to come back and, and look at the video. And of course you can go to Kanayo Adibe, K-A-N-A-Y-O-A-D-I-B-E.com. Uh, but Kanayo's work is is just stunning. And what we're going to actually focus on today is the way that his street photography has influenced his wedding photography. Because if we go to, on Instagram, Project Asphalt, uh, you'll see this stunning, stunning work. Uh, Kanayo, maybe maybe you can just comment on this as, as I'm scrolling down here. It's just beautiful, beautiful stuff. And, and forgive me, one more, oh, there we go. We had a little audio issue. Say that one more time. I was like, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, uh, my, my street photography, I mean, it's, 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 been, it's been really great to uh, be, you know, experience street photography. And you know, when I first started shooting, I actually started with street photography because you know, I got my first camera um, and you know, there's this saying that the, the streets are always posing, you know, so like, it's harder to find models. And, uh, and then when you just start out, actually, when it's harder to find models and weddings. But with street photography, there are always people available. Um, so as a way to learn my camera, and, you know, get proficient with with image making, I, I took to the streets. Um, and a lot of what I learned from streets kind of like, you know, got put back into the weddings. Um, for the for one thing, I got I, I got really comfortable with I call it variability and chaos because the streets has no true order to it. Like it's just a bunch of a whole bunch of random things happening and random people. But you know, after when you learn how to find order and actually make images that you actually want to make, like versus take random pictures of things, but actually find ways to create images that you want to make with the randomness of you know the street when you develop that skill set you're able to like show up to a wedding and you can literally see a wedding that's a more stru uh, scripted environment because you know we kind of know how weddings play out every wedding is almost this is you know slightly different from the other but the the script is the same you know we know the, the bride is going to walk down the aisle we know the groom might cry or we know the mother of the bride might cry so when you go from a, a situation where everything is chaotic and you you learn how to find order in that chaos you take that skill set to a wedding and it's just you see everything that's happening because you know your senses are, are heightened and you're able to like pick up on little things happening in corners that you know the the, the average photographer won't even notice because they're so focused on what, looking at the the main characters in the scene um so you know, some of that stuff is what has helped enhance my, especially the documentary side of my weddings. I, that, that makes sense. And, and again, for those of you listening in, what we're going to be focusing on today is this conversation around not just street photography, but the way that street photography has ultimately affected 
Ganayo's work. We're going to talk about what makes good street photography and then how that translates to wedding photography. More specifically, as Kanaya was just alluding to, Kanaya, you mentioned um, ahead of time, actually not even ahead of time, I think it was actually on your Instagram page. Uh, it, it says documenting the human condition. This is, it seems to be maybe this is the definition that you give street photography or would you give it a, a different definition? So, well, um, I think it's the definition that I give my street photography because I think, you know, street, street photography is very broad and some people don't even you know, they don't necessarily uh, focus on the human element, the human aspect of it. Sometimes they just create images, uh, images that are designed, you know, more aesthetic images. Um, some people focus heavily on documentary. Um, some people just, you know, focus on things happening on the street that don't really have, that the human doesn't necessarily play a picture in the overall image. Hmm. Um, but for me, I... I, 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 my, my, my street photography, as, as aesthetic as it might be, or designed as it might be, there's always a human element to it. And, you know, there's certain things that I focus on when, you know, when making those pictures. So what, what initially drew you to this idea of street photography? I mean, did the street photography come before weddings or vice versa? Um, it, it's, it started off with street. Um, but I, when I first started off the street, I, I wasn't shooting street photography the way I shoot it today. Um, it was more random photos. Um, then I learned, you know, over time, I learned how to make pictures on the street and how to make more, you know, be more, uh, be more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> be more thoughtful, be more, have more intention. You know, sure. create photos on the street with more intent. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so it's evolved since since the original starts, you know, in the streets. But it definitely came before street before our weddings. It's interesting that you talk about intention, because I think for a lot of people, including myself, in some cases, when we look at the work of other street photographers, maybe not so much the stuff that I'm seeing on, on your Instagram page, but some of the street work that I've seen over the years has in some ways felt a little bit random, but you would suggest that there is very, very much intention there. Well, I guess if you were to break it down, what would you say percentage wise is the split between that intentionality and then maybe just a little bit of luck in the moment? So there's, um, so, 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 so I think it's, it's a combination of both, right? Like, uh, you, like, you, with street photography, I feel like you kind of make your own luck, right? Like hmm. you might, I'll give it, I'll give it a rough example. Say you're standing, you see a wall that's red, right? And you want somebody in red clothes to walk by. Sure. Right? You see that. So you, so you make an image with a person in red, with a, with, with a guy walking, a person in red, walking by a red wall with a red car. Right. And the, the viewer looks at that image and thinks, oh, wow, they were lucky. They just, happen to see that and take that one picture and make that shot however right. that person could have stayed there for two days or came back several weeks trying to make that image till the day everything lined up um so you never as a as a viewer you never see the the, the process behind the one image that seemed very lucky um but if you ask me someone who spends days trying to make a certain image that's that was more that was intention, right? Like one yeah. day they did get lucky because they kept they kept they kept that and they kept coming back to make that one picture. And one day everything lined up where they made that one picture. And that day they were lucky. However, the the days that you know led to it was the intention, and the, 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 they 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 dreamt of that image, and eventually that image happened. Um, so that's just a rough, you know. There are so, so many images that happen that are like look seem very lucky but a lot of the times the the process behind it is not luck but intention and yes you know um long suffering you know reading leading <laughs> up to that point where the luck where the luck the luck happens you know yeah. so that actually totally makes sense and the reason i laugh too because when you say long suffering i was making this this comparison between what you were saying about good street photography and the significance of intention versus luck and my experience in the last year learning how to day trade because a lot of people would say, you know, getting into the marketplace and day trading is, it's lucky. You're just, you know, you're gambling, it's luck. And if you do well, you're lucky. And obviously that's not the case. There's, there's actually quite a bit of strategy that goes into it. And 
now, if I'm doing it right, I have, not only do I have a clearly outlined strategy, but I'm following that strategy and I set very intentional goals. If I get so, you know, quote unquote lucky, maybe I make a little bit extra in the moment, but, but what I do make, what, how I do walk away with profit comes from intentionality. It comes from strategy and it does come from a lot of long suffering as well. So that was kind of an interesting comparison that I was making in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely uh, is it, it makes totally sense to like when you when you put it that way and come do those draw those two comparisons. It makes it's it's very similar. Like, you know, um, uh, they say luck is half. I think I forget the same. I think it's like luck is is a percentage preparation, and uh, I think it's like ninety percent preparation and ten percent actual luck or something. I forget right. the actual saying, but there's a saying that that actually makes you know makes the statement that luck isn't necessarily luck oh it's, i think it's 90 percent something about opportunity and and preparation you know yep. it's luck yeah you know yeah i forget the percentages but yeah so that's basically what it is you know well so let's let's talk about maybe if, if you were to pick say three of the most important elements of good street photography and of course we're going to connect this to the idea of of wedding photography here in just a second but looking specifically at street photography what would you say are the top two or three elements of good street photography at least from your perspective so light composition and moment and i think this translates through every it's not just with streets but like it goes into every other human focused genre of photography Great. I'm, I'm taking um, notes here. Light. Composition and moment. Those three things. So okay. a lot of the moments is gestures and things like that. But yeah, go ahead. You're going to ask. The question. Well, I was, I was going to say, so, <clears throat> excuse me, what, so when we talk about light, um, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you're, when you talk about this idea of being intentional as a street photographer, what are you doing intentionally with light? So, um, light could be what dictates the scene that I, I pick, um, <clears throat> for street. So there's a, there's a method of street that's called the fishing method where you literally find the scene that you want to photograph in. And like I mentioned the red wall, for instance, but here it could be like a nice pocket of nice light, maybe something that's very contrasty, high, high big, you know, highlight, a nice highlight and like a lot of shadows or something. So you first identify that, that the light that you want to use, then you can now form a composition around it. You see the scene and that basically sets the scene. You have a nice composition, nicely framed composition, and maybe a nice beam of light. Then the moment is you want a gesture or a reaction, which now brings in the human element. So you want a person performing a certain kind of act or giving off a certain kind of emotion or you know, a, 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 a gesture that, 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 that's, you know, calls the, the viewer's attention. So, you know, now you set the scene, you have the scene, the composition, and you wait for a person that gives you the reaction or wearing the outfits or, you know, performing some kind of, of gesture that you want to come into that frame and you make your picture right at the time you want to make it. So in a sense, you design that image and, um, you know, you actually make the image that you envisioned in your head versus snapping something that just is random, randomly occurring. That, that makes, that makes a lot of sense actually. And again, there's that, there is the intentionality, the understanding, the skill set that drives the behavior, especially as it relates to light composition and being ready for the moment. It seems like the light and the composition build up. You're, you're thinking about light and composition and there is a certain amount of intentionality there. And then there's a readiness for that moment when it happens and then you you capture that that frame is that kind of how it looks absolutely that is exactly what it is so let's then translate that to the wedding photography and and what at this point like what percentage of your f photography career say in a year is made up of wedding photography versus street photography is the wedding photography what what is ultimately driving your business making you money and street photography is is more of a hobby or how do you break that down so um, street photography, I consider it to be a palette cleanser for my weddings. Ooh, I like um, that. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, so I, I use that as my true creative outlet. Like initially, you know, you start off as a photographer, when you start off in wedding photography, you know, as a young photographer, 
you have all these dreams and wanting to be different and the best and all of that and bring your flavor and, your, and it's all about you, 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 you. Then you get hit with checks and expectations of the industry. And then you have to, it seems like sometimes you have to conform because if when money comes into the picture, you're not, you, you, it stops really being about you, right? And um, I mean, some people are fortunate to, to have client base that 100% don't give them input and just say, do what you want to do. But the way business works with planners and other people in between, um, even be between the clients who might be hundred percent fine with you doing what you want, but planners have their own expectations because it's all business and, you know, money driven, you start to lose a little bit of your creative control and start mm. to cater to other people. Um, so that became really stressful for me um, because like I said, I did not start off as a business. I started off as somebody who wanted creative outlets and just thought it was awesome that people wanted to pay me to express myself creatively. Um, so because of that, you know, I started taking the street photography, which is, I, I am the client at this point now because it's all about what I want to do and yeah. I can make images however I want to make it. And the images are always available. The players are always there. I just need to go outside. Um, and that's, you know, became my palate cleanser for if I'm ex experiencing, you know, if I just want to express myself, I'm experiencing stress from weddings and stuff like that. So, um, as far as the breakdown goes, yes, weddings are majority of my, you know, form majority of my income stream th uh, through photography, I mean, and all the other lifestyle stuff that are kind of associated with weddings, you know, sure. maternity and, you know, engagement sessions. Um, but fortunately... <laughs> Street photography has also created its own income stream. Like it just randomly did. Um, so I've had commercial work that have several commercial jobs that have come as a result of my street photography work. Um, you know, I've worked with clients like Nordstrom and, you know, a few others done ad advertisements and stuff like that. And, you know, I've also sold prints. Um, yeah. I've had work in galleries and stuff like that. So um, it has created its own income stream, but it's not as constant as the weddings. You know, weddings is a year year round thing. So um, that's kind of the breakdown um, for that. That makes sense. So would you say, and, and I, this is kind of backtracking just a little bit because it was something I was thinking about earlier, but what, I know you said that you started in, in street photography, then it was wedding photography. And we're going to talk about how that influences your wedding photography in just a second. But what were the initial inspiration or inspirations, I should say, <clears throat> with regards to street photography, who were you looking to? Whose work uh, did you find inspiration from? Did you did you take classes? Where did this street photography originally come from for you? Um, so, so I, right at the beginning, there was there was no one. It was really just there are people on the street. I I want to use my camera. I'm just gonna go out there and do stuff. Um, and then. You know, I started to notice, you know, I'd shoot, like I'd, I'd go online and just do random research on how do you, you know, make, t make pictures on the street? Like, what do you do? And, sure. and everybody has their guidelines. They talk, you know, they talk about composition or oh, photograph people doing stuff, you know? So I'll just walk around and just randomly, if someone is like playing sports or something, like they're skateboarders or something, I'll, I'll photograph them doing that. Yeah. Um, then as time went on, I started to get exposed to more actual street photographers you know um i the my favorite actually is james i think it's natchway is how you pronounce his name yeah um he's a war he's a war photographer and mm -hmm. he does like he photographs the probably the worst things in the world so beautifully and mm. you know he, he he's almost like a fine arts he has a fine arts really really uh when i say graphic like composition rich um, framing, lighting, it's all amazing. But he's photographing like the, some of the most horrific things you can see. But they're like, these are like beautiful pictures of bad things because sure. war is bad. And, you know, um, but I love that he could, he, he still like approached his documentary from an artistic standpoint. Because at the end of the day, it's, for me, it's all about the art expression. It's being able to like create visually striking imagery. Yeah. Um, and, and so he was a big one. Um, then there's the Bruno Barbie. He's a, he's a Magnum photographer. I'd seen his work and he also is a composition. He's, he's all about the composition. So if you look at my work, you can tell like 
there's a lot of thoughts that goes into my compositions. You, either are street or, or 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 weddings. It's very graphic in a sense, visually striking. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of like I kind of like, you know, even um the the the, the master uh, Henry Cartier Bresson. He's another person who creates visually striking imagery. So anyone who has really rich compositions is someone that I would not, not naturally gravitate to. Um, but those were the three people when I saw their work that kind of like made me realize that, Hey man, you can actually, you know, cause images that are composed really well, you almost feel like, you know, it, it kind of like is baffling because it's like, how did he know this was going to happen? You know, this, this random act is going to happen that he had enough time to actually frame it the way he did. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and that's kind of like one of the things about the whole fishing method that I thought. So I learned about those kind of things and how you anticipate the moments and you wait for something to happen versus quick snaps. Because when you do a quick snap, you never, all the other things don't fall into place. The lighting could be bad. Right. The, the, the composition could be bad. You know what I mean? And the moment, and you might just be chasing a moment, but not really thinking about all the other pieces of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. So I learned about that from after looking at those guys and their work and, that's where a lot of that inspiration came from. Well, and I have to say too, as, as we're talking about that composition, I'm, I'm going to pull up your, your Instagram account again here. One second. So what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing here, I mean, we talk about the composition, for example, this image. And for those of you listening in, you're going to want to either come back and check out the video or at least go to, to Kanayo's Instagram account, which is Kanayo, K-A-N-A-Y-O underscore Adibe, A-D-I-B-E. And of course, we'll link to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But this image right here, I, I'm, I'm assuming this is a bride who is about to step into her dress. Is that right? I mean, this is, this is stunning. Absolutely. It is. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's definitely a, a bride stepping into her dress. Um, I don't even know where I got the inspiration for that. But actually, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I tried that before in one of my, my weddings. But this was like my first actually it was my first wedding. I tried that. But I was still learning. Right. So I didn't know about how, you know, I have this thing where I say lenses are, are paintbrushes, right? They're like paintbrushes where every lens has a, a purpose or has its strengths. Right. And being able to understand your lenses as and see them as really just paintbrushes or tools to get certain job get the job done or get certain types of images um i i shot that the first time with a 50 millimeter lens and it just didn't look the same you know so when i learned about how wide angles really help change change perspective and show different lens a 20 20 millimeter at this time and it, it was a totally different image i really you know, made really, you know, created an image that really showed how I feel expressed or showed how it feels to be a bride. You know, this grand gesture of a bride putting on her dress. I feel like it was captured better with that, with that lens. And, you know, it gave the feel that I wanted the, the viewer to, to feel. Oh, it, it's stunning. And again, for those of you listening, and I've got it pulled up on screen here, it's just, there's, there's, we talk about this, the combination or Kanaya, you talked about the combination of the intention behind the shot you know what you were looking for you are there and ready for the image and then you snap that frame at the moment that in this case the the bride happens to also be smiling you can see her foot about to step through that hole in the dress but you have the perspective of the dress surrounding it and of course that naturally draws the viewer's eye to the middle of the image where it's in focus i mean it's just the combination is absolutely amazing thank you man thank you very much yeah, beautiful, beautiful work. Well, again, we're going to link to uh, this, both the, both the Instagram accounts, actually in the show notes at bocopodcast.com. But Kadawa, before um, we, we get to some rapid fire questions here, I want to ask more specifically, I know you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but let's let's talk specifically about what is inspiring you from your street photography. What elements, I guess I should say, you're taking specifically from your street photography to the wedding day, as you're going through that day, whether it's preparation, like we just saw now during the ceremony or portraits, maybe later on during the reception, are there two or three big ideas that you're taking, uh, maybe in addition to that light composition moment that you're taking to the wedding day that you have learned from your experience as a street photographer as well? So I think the, the main things are composition and moment. However, there are skills that are built like, you know, I feel like as a street photographer, the more you shoot on the street, 
your situational awareness actually is developed. Like you, you see things, you know, and it's like, you see everything happening at the same time. Um, and that is a, when, when you, you know, you develop that kind of skill set. that is something that is very, very useful in a wedding day. Like it's, it's one of those things where it, it, you know, it allows you to be able to see what's happening with your, with the bride and groom, but also see what's happening with the guests at the same time. So you can create these stories and link layered shot, you know, create layered shots where you link emotions that are happening on this side with the bride and groom to like an emotion of somebody in the, in the, you know, sitting in the, sitting in the audience viewing them. Um, you can it's like seriously heightened. Um, and that's the thing about, you know, you being in the street and there's like just so many random things happening, but you're able to like find stories and piece things together, you know? Um, so I think, beyond the light composition and moment, I think this heightened sense of, you know, your heightened senses and your ability to pull link stories is is like one of the biggest uh, benefits I have had, um, hmm. I've seen from being a street photographer. Well, you know, I, I actually, I like the fact that we've, we've really brought it back to those three elements. I'm, I'm a bit of a minimalist. I like to look at things very, very simply at times that kind of bites me a little bit, but, um, I think that many times we tend to overcomplicate life just as human beings and certainly as photographers. So I like that you can bring it back to these big ideas because I can imagine as a photographer, I mean, I, I shot for about 10 years. I'm not currently actively shooting, but if I were to go back to start photographing weddings, for example, every time I put that camera up to my eye, I can imagine running those three words through my head and it would be such a great frame of reference, a structure within which, which to photograph. There's freedom in it, especially because it, it creates a certain amount of readiness and there's certainly an intention innate to it. But if I constantly have those three points in my head, running through my head at all times, I can imagine I would just be that much better a photographer as a result. Yeah, it, it, it definitely changes the game because, you know, um, I've, I've seen people you know, like you know, I do mentorship, mentorship and stuff like that. And, you know, I've had people show me images when I'm critiquing them and I'm like, you know, you have one or two of these elements in here, but if you imagine if you had the third one or, you know, see how it changed your, your, your lighting isn't that good, but your composition is decent and you have a moment, but imagine if the light was this way and what, how much it elevates that image. Um, so once you have this, like, it's like a, that's the formula, I think those three things, um, and you're visually your image becomes impactful, I believe. Um, and the other, you know, the heightened awareness thing is just a way to expand the types types of images you can make um, and the kinds of stories you can include in your photographs. Well, uh, Ed, we're going to put these these uh, points for everybody as a point of reference in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. And uh, shout out to Jill, who produces our show, who puts together the show notes for all of these episodes. If, if for those of you listening in or watching, you're not taking advantage, make sure you go to bocapodcast.com. You can see the current episodes that we have out. We actually have close to 500 episodes out now. And uh, thanks to Kanayo, who is adding to that just wealth of information. But along with each of those episodes, there are show notes as well. So make sure that you take advantage of those for everybody listening in and watching. Uh, so can I, I want to jump from this conversation around street and wedding photography and their, their relationship to a few rapid fire questions here before we finish up, if I can, uh, something we talk a lot about here on the Boca podcast is brand position or what the, the unique value proposition of your business is. How would you position yourself in the market that you're currently in? And maybe go ahead and mention the marketplace that you're currently working in as well. So I'm a DMV photographer so I service primarily service uh the D DMV um but I do travel for weddings um as far as my brand um so you know I think you know so, so what I get back from clients I feel like I am my brand in a sense because you know a lot of these are wedding photography companies are essentially one man run a lot of them um, some people have been able to build up a studio with several photographers, but for a lot of us, it's, we are essentially our brand and with the way social media works these days, you know, and people, people are looking clients, potential clients are looking at you, the person. Um, so I feel, you know, me being, being that I'm a different, everybody's kind everybody's different. We're all different people. We all have different styles, different tastes, different likes. Um, and I feel like, what makes my brand different is the fact that it's me, right? And 
not as as much as my imagery differs from the next guy. I don't feel like I make work that I feel like. So one of the compliments I get a lot of times is that people see my like they're scrolling on Instagram and an image shows up and they can tell it's my image before mm. before they see who posts it, right? So and that's something I've heard like my whole career, you know. So it's like I think you know a lot of clients who find me really come to me for my work. It's never really about how you know how much how inexpensive I might be compared to the next guy or how sure. much more I cost compared to the next guy, but it's usually because they've seen my work and they don't see anything else like it. Mm. Um, and, you know, beyond that, I feel another thing is my customer service. Like it's, you know, so I worked in the corporate, corporate world in IT and, you know, we are very responsive people. Like that's something I've, I, I, I was as a customer service person within IT because IT is prim primarily customer service. You're always serving the, you know, the user, users of your application or sure. infrastructure. So one of the things I, I uh, get from clients is how responsive I am. Like, you know, I respond to, I literally respond to anything as soon as I see it. Um, some people put things on the back burner and do other things, but every time is, you know, I, you thank you for for getting back to us so quickly. Thank you for getting back so getting back to us so quickly. And a lot of times, mm. even after they have booked me, the communication process is really good. I'm equally as responsive, you know, when I'm trying to get a job from the, uh, get a booking from them, as, as well as when the booking has been done and we've shot and they're asking for their images. I'm still that you know as responsive. So, um, I think I believe that that really sets me apart. Um, based on what I've, the feedback I've gotten, because it's like, if everyone is mentioning how responsive you are and how great your customer service is, it must mean that they don't see that a lot of that um, around. Um, so can I ask you about that? Because that's, yeah. I, I find that very interesting that the in a world where kind of instant gratification via, you know, a, a text message or a DM from Instagram or a messenger or whatever it might be, this is this is a norm for us. We're used to engaging that way with our friends, family, or otherwise. You're bringing that to bear with your clients, which I think is is really interesting. I know that, in, in some ways, we could probably all do a little bit better job of that. But how do you balance being so responsive with also not getting sucked into your phone or computer all the time? Or is that even a, really a concern for you? Have you have you found that it's it's a problem that you're that you're doing that too much? It's taking up too much of your time. So in the world we live in today, um, I mean, we are sucked into our phones. Like this is the new world. Like sure. everybody's on Instagram every day. Like if anything, I'm actually not on Instagram as much as the next guy. Okay. So that might actually free up time for me to talk to my clients, right? Like, you know, if you make money from Instagram, which a few people do, you know, I know a booking can come via Instagram, but if like you're an influencer and your actual revenue comes from being on Instagram, then I get dedicating all that time to it, right? But for me, my, a lot of my inquiries come from my website. Like people find me through mm. Google and stuff like that. And um, so I don't spend a lot of time on social media just to be on there. Um, I'm there when it, for, for when it counts to post, when, when I post, you know, respond to anything to help boost the post and stuff like that. But I don't spend a ton of time on social media. Sure. But a lot of that time now translates into me giving the actual paying clients attention and being, and sometimes, man, it takes a few seconds to respond to a text message or an email. It's That's a fair. quick question. And, you know, and to me, if someone emails me and I see it and I can respond to them within two, three minutes of their emails, and I know that's going to leave, leave a good taste in their mouth. Mm. Like, especially if they need timely information or something, they feel good. Okay, boom, it's done. They're excited. They're happy. And that translates into reviews five star i have all the reviews i've gotten in my career are five star reviews like i've never gotten a four star review and it's all there on google wow. it's there every five star reviews you know so in addition to giving them quality images giving them you know uh giving them my time and great customer service it all it all translates into those five five star reviews and that stuff goes a long way um so i just i just do the best i can you know to keep make my keep my clients happy I, I love how practical you are about it. I, I'm a I'm a pretty emotional guy, and and I tend to overanalyze and overthink. And I think a lot of photographers feel very similarly. So, for example, if they started to set the standard, which is if I see a message come in from any platform, I'm going to respond immediately. 
I think a lot of photographers kind of get carried away and that they get sucked into it. And then at, you know, eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night, they're still doing the same thing. And there's, there's never a kind of a disconnect from work for the sake of their personal life, their personal relationships or otherwise. I, I, I don't, you don't strike me as one who has trouble with that. I just love the, the practical element of, you know what, it's there. It's not going to take me a long time. I do it. And what it results in is a much better client experience, which naturally of course builds your business. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I just feel we, we, we spend, think about people who are on Twitter and tweeting every five seconds about nothing. Um, <laughs> or people who are on, or people who are on, on Facebook arguing about nothing. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't put my time there. So I, I literally put my time to the things that matter, you know, cause, uh, time is the most important currency mm. there is. So I, I kind of make it count where I focus my, my attention. Um, and you know, the way I respond to my clients is the way I respond to my friends, the way I respond to anyone. I am responsive. I just, my nature. And for me, it bugs me when, if someone reaches out to me and I can like, let them know right there and then what's good, it bugs me as a person. I just like being responsive. Yeah. Um, I answer the phone. If I don't know who is calling, I don't scream calls. I answer unless it says scam likely or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might not. But you know what's funny? I have answered a scam likely call and it's a potential client. So now I answer scam likely calls just in case. Wow. You know? Um, yeah, because, you know, sometimes if someone cold calls you off of Google, if your number is on Google and someone cold calls you, your phone might, you know, your network might think it's a scam call because it's a number that they're not familiar with or something. Sure. And I've, I've noticed that there were potential clients from that. So I'm like, okay, yeah, from now on, I'm answering every, every call that rings in my phone. Um, I have been known to respond late hours of the night, like somebody might text me, email me at 12 a.m. thinking I'll answer it at nine in the morning. In five minutes, the response comes because I'm awake. So why not? You know what sure. I mean? Like, so sure. that's just my, my attitude towards these things. That, you know? But I have a lot of respect for that, actually, because I, I think, again, I tend to overthink things a little bit too much and I'm trying to compartmentalize work and personal life. You're just, as a kind of a principle, you're responsive to whatever it is that you're engaged with, friends, family, or clients. And you're not making that big of a deal about it. You're just getting it done. And again, I have a lot of respect for that. And I think it's good inspiration and reminder for all of us uh, in that regard. I have one more question for you. And, and this is a very curious one. Is there a particular book or maybe audiobook or otherwise that you found inspiration from? And, and I'm, I'm actually thinking about this more from a photographic standpoint. Like, do you have these, do you have a whole stack of coffee table books at home, street photography that you find inspiration from origi or, or on a regular basis or are you, do you like other types of books? Is, is there a particular book or a couple of books you would recommend to our listeners? So I have, um, for photo books, I have The Suffering of Light by mm. Alex Webb. Um, it's, it's a really cool, it's a really cool book. Um, and it's, it's one that really, you know, I forgot to mention him when I talked about inspirations. Um, because I have made pictures and people's like, oh, that looks like something Alex Webb would do. You know what I mean? Mm. And so clearly he has inspired some, 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 some of my ideas and the way he uses lights in that book is really interesting. A lot of contrasty high, you know, um, high, not high key, low key images, harsh lights with lots of shadows. Um, I also have, um, David Allen Harvey's, uh, Cuba book. Um, I'm a big fan of Cuba. I've been there three, three times in okay. three years. Um, uh, and I've made a lot of awesome street Cuba, I think is the best, one of the best places in the world for street photography, mm -hmm. because it's one of those places where you could, I feel like if you ever wanted to boost your confidence as a photographer, you go to Cuba and you close your eyes and spray. And if you, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you just close your eyes and turn around in 360 and spray. And when you look at your images, you probably have something really good in there. It's that good because life happens on the street. America, I think the street is a transitional place. People are going from one place to another. Oh, wow. I driving. like that distinction. You know, yeah. But, you know, in, in, in Cuba, life is actually happening on the street. People are sitting on the streets. People have their living room, their house, uh, house doors, apartment doors open. And as you're walking by, you can see all the way through their house and they're like living. So they live on the street. Um, so there's always something to photograph. And it's a very colorful country. Um, the people, for, for some reason, the people match the environment. So, you know, I've seen, there's a, a picture my friend took and it's a, it's a bus. And the bus has like blue... And like like a red top and like blue and I think yellow and there's a guy sitting next to the bus with blue on and he had a red hat and he literally matched the outfit of the, of the wow. bus. I don't know if that was I don't know if that was intentional, but those kind of things 
happen everywhere and just available all over the place. So sometimes you take a picture looking for something else. And when you review it, you see this other matching thing. And you're like, wow, I didn't even notice that. But it's there. <laughs> and it just happens. It happens so often and often. So, um, yeah, I love Cuba. That's a little plug for Cuba. Um, but, yeah, those. So as far as inspirational books, those are some of the books. Um, another thing that has inspired me as a person, you know, personal life and professional life, um, is the is the book is called The Secret. Okay. Um, it talks about the law of attraction, mm -hmm. um, the law of attraction, the energy in the universe, and stuff like that. And um, it was one. It was a pill that was a lot easier for me to swallow because, you know, if you kind of when you kind of reference your life, or I reference my life, I can see how a lot of the things they talk about in the book, kind of like things were that, that were kind of things that happened to me. So it's like, you know, say say for instance, you you one day decide that you want to be a really good race car driver or the best race car driver. And that's all you think about. And you're always thinking about it. And one day you decide, I want to get, you know, I'm going to get, get a car and start trying it out. And you just have that desire to be the best race car driver. Eventually, you probably can or will be one of the best race car drivers because you're really putting out that energy into the universe. And, you know, the universe hears you and creates a way for you to do it literally aligns things in the world hmm. for, for you to become that really great race car driver. I wanted to become a good photographer. I thought about it. And in four years or so, people knew who I was. Um, and, you know, that was like, so I, I think about everything else in my life that has happened. And it came from me having a goal and really thinking about it and wanting it to happen. And they all just happen. And sometimes I wonder, how did this happen? And I really can't, you know, it's not like I, I had a grand plan or, or, or I had this all, you know, figured out. I just, it just started with a dream or a goal. And the universe found a way. So that book is awesome. Um, and they're even like smaller parts of, of it beyond just career and stuff. Some people start wanted, like, if you listen to like um, people like really successful people, Jim Carrey, um, Steve Harvey, uh, Will Smith. A lot of the things they talk about when it comes to achieving dreams and success and stuff are all things that you would see in that book, The Secret. And it's all about the law of attraction and just wanting and just start. You want to you wanna be a comedian? Just, just start. Go out and start making jokes. One day you will be that good because you really want to be that good. You know, you're going to put in the work and, and, and the, the, star, the, the, the stars will align to, to allow you to do these things. So that's so, like, to me, one of the most, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I'm just curious though, too, because I, I know that there is a tendency in our culture. I've certainly been guilty of it as well to, you know, we, we talk about dreams and that's kind of where it stops. There's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of thinking, but I, where I guess I would push back I, and I've read, I've never read the secret. Um, I, I, it does seem as though, at least based on my life, my little bit of life experience so far, that when you not only put the idea out there, but then actually do something about it, that's where the doors start to open up. And, and I think it's important to make that distinction. We talked earlier about that. I, I mentioned the fact that, that you seem so practical, that you you have this idea and you do the thing, right? Rather than overthinking, rather than, than, um, than overanalyzing and what if this happens and what if that happens and getting caught up in your emotion, you just do it. And again, I have a lot of respect for that because not only is that a weakness for me at times, but I know that it is for a lot of photographers who tend to be more emotional types as well. So what do you think the element of doing and the practicality of doing, what role does that play in this idea of the universe and the way that it makes way for you? Wouldn't you say that, that those who do are more likely, it, kind of like we were talking about earlier, it's not like if we sit around waiting for the luck of the draw, this beautiful thing to happen, this dream that we have in our head, but don't actually do anything about it. It seems like a lot of those people will never achieve that gene versus those who actually go and do and work and, and the intention translates to action. It seems like those are the people that get results. What are your thoughts? Yes. Um, I really do believe that being open to, to, to trying things is important. Like I'll give an example. Um, so for me, I said, I wanted to be a great photographer. Right. And then I also decided that I would say yes to anything 
that made me uncomfortable. Mm. So speaking, I hate, I never liked public speaking. I remember in college, I'll give presentations and I'll freeze up. I forget one line and I freeze up in front of the class. Now I public speak. I give, I, I speak at conferences. I, I host photography uh, workshops. I, yeah. I'm talking to you now. <laughs> this is public, right? I'm talking to you now. Yeah. You know, so, so there's a one to having the dream and wanting something to happen. But if you're just stagnant and not doing anything, like you know, you might say you want to be a millionaire today, right? Then a cryptocurrency opportunity comes knocking on the door. And you're like, ah, oh, no, I know I'm not gonna put twenty five dollars here or thousand dollars there. I'm not gonna do it. That might have been the the opening, the law mm -hmm. of attraction. That have been the, the universe might have presented that. Hey, here is your million dollar opportunity. Mm -hmm. I might not tell you that it is, but if you act on something, you might get that result, right? So you have to act. You have to do something. Um, you know. If you want to be the best photographer, you need to get a camera and start shooting. You know, if you want to be a good one, you want to, you know, you have to act on something. Um, and as long as you act, I believe the universe will make a way for things to happen. Even if you never saw the, the path in the, in the future, you'd be able to connect the dots and look back and be like, oh, wow, this was a, this is how it was all supposed to happen. And this was the dream, but this is how, now that I'm here, I can see how it all pieced together to make it happen. Um, so you definitely need to act, especially if it's something you want. You just can't sit on your couch and expect that you'd all, all on one day be the best, one of the best photographers if you don't ever pick up a camera and shoot. I, I think you, you summed up our conversation beautifully at this point. And, and it feels honestly like we've only scratched the surface. I, I, there's so much I don't know about you and, and your work and, and I'm sure all the technique uh, that goes into the work that you create. You mentioned that you do some mentoring, teaching workshops, this type of thing. Can you share a little bit about how our listeners can learn a little bit more about those opportunities to learn from you? So um, right now, um, I I have a Patreon. So my Patreon is, if you search my name, Patreon slash Kanayo Adive, you'd find it. Um, and and there I have, I literally I post out, post content, video content on different ideas, my different ideas with photography. Um, from how I make certain images, you know, um, I talk about light, I talk about textures, I talk about, you know, uh, composition, I do critiques of images, I mentor, I have people who are, you know, taking mentorship classes for me. Um, I also used to host, prior to the pandemic, I hosted uh, in-person workshops, and that you can find on my website. Um, but I haven't, you know, as of right now, I don't know what I'm going to be doing with that, um, just because of the pandemic. But for now, the Patreon is active. And I'm always posting content there and sharing with other photographers. Yeah, and I've actually got that pulled up on the screen here. For anybody who's listening in, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash Kanayo, K-A-N-A-Y-O, Adibe, A-D-I-B-E. We'll link to this, of course, in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But I appreciate you you sharing that, Kanayo, because I mean, ultimately, I, I want our listeners to be able to, to come to you for more advice, to learn more. Because I, again, I feel like we've only scratched the surface on a very loaded topic, not just street photography, but your wedding photography. And to that end, I also just want to pull up here um, one more of the pages on your website because your, your work is just beautiful. We talk about the significance of composition. And if, if for those of you listening in, if you go to kanayaadiba.com and go to Portfolio and Weddings, I'm just scrolling through this page here and, and your just stunning, stunning eye for composition is readily visible here as I just scroll down the page. It, truly beautiful work, Kanayo. And, and I have to say again that like this is, this is far and above beyond what I ever accomplished as a photographer. A lot of respect for you uh, in that regard. And, and I really appreciate you sharing with all of our listeners today. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Well, it's... it's it's been it truly has been a privilege and uh, for everybody listening in again we'll link to all the resources that we mentioned the books the urls the talking points everything in the show notes at bocapodcast.com make sure you check that out thank you everybody for hanging out for listening in thanks once again Kanayo. i really appreciate your time thank you man thanks for having me